Very cool. Well, thanks for having me. Um, really appreciate the uh, the Eco Factory crew and uh, the folks, the organizers, kind of kind of putting this event together. This is really cool. I didn't, you know, a week ago I didn't know, or two weeks ago I didn't know too much about this, but much appreciated many for kind of putting me up on game on what's happening here. This is super cool. Uh, so, a little bit about me. Um, I'm from the area. Mom's from Pasadena. I went to high school not too far from here. Claremont College's undergrad. Just got back about a year ago uh, with the uh, the Greycroft LA team. Um, and so basically, what I'm going to do today, I uh, just kind of give a quick agenda, is generally talk about. So I'll give a little introduction on me and the fund. Uh, kind of fly through those slides and get to the more important stuff. Uh, and that being one kind of the growth in VC and what the VC market has looked like over the last kind of 10 years. And my goal is basically to pull out some, some learnings from that that I think are impacting uh, what the early stage fundraising market looks like today. Uh, and so I'll pull out some reflections there. And then I'll go into kind of based on those reflections, maybe what you know, Seed, Series A, Founders, uh, can do uh, to stand out from the crowd um, and, and you know, hopefully run a more successful you know, fundraising process. All right, let's get into it. Okay, cool. So very quickly about myself, senior associate at Graycroft. Uh, so from the LA area, I went to Claremont McKenna for undergrad. After CMC left and joined CS here in LA, focused on LevFen and, and LBOs and a bunch of different types of buyouts, um, left there, went to Detroit and joined a firm called Detroit Venture Partners, uh, helped raise our first fund and deploy about half the capital there. Um, the original fund was about $50 million. Um, we did seed, pre-seed investments. Um, after that, kind of got the bug to join and, and help build companies and, and learn from that process. Um, so join the, the founding team of a company called Operator. We use machine learning to help people buy things. A lot of people call it conversational commerce now. Um, from there, I got really interested in machine learning and felt like I didn't know anything about that. And so I wanted to leave and have a different experience. Jumped to a company called Nementa. It's an artificial intelligence research company, so no product. Um, just a lot of white papers and reading. And then from there, I went back to school uh, at Booth in Chicago and then uh, kind of jump to the Graycroft team. Um, so just a quick overview on us. All right, who are we? We were started in early 2000s by three, three folks. Dana Settle is the not only co-founder, but also runs the, the LA office here. Um, we are about 45% B2B, 55% B2C, um, and have always been distributed. So with the office in New York City and then also office uh, here in LA, we tend to be fairly active. Uh, we were kind of top 20 in, in 2018. Um, on the Series A side, we typically try to get to about 15 and 20 new Series A investments a year. Um, and then uh, there's, there's a significant amount more focused on the seed. Uh, more importantly, kind of like what we believe, right? Um, the first thing is that uh, syndicating and uh, you know, with investment, additional investment partners, not only increases the opportunity for success uh, from the investing standpoint, but it helps us build uh, and be a part of building more profitable, uh, you know, bigger, scalable companies. And so we syndicate about ninety percent of the time. Um, the second is uh, is that entrepreneurs are the customer. At the end of the day, like that's kind of who we're serving. Um, you know, I always like to say VCs at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're selling money, right? Um, and our goal is that, you know, my money is not necessarily greener, but hopefully more helpful than, than the next person's, right? And so that's part of kind of uh, one of the core assets for us, we believe. Um, and kind of how that's reflected is, is when it comes to flexibility and economics at the front end of the, at the, of the partnership. And we have no minimum ownership percentage for any seed in Series A. Uh, investment, so we have zero threshold. We're not looking for 20% or 25% or 15. It, it really is kind of a partnership. Uh, and so we work with the founder to kind of agree on a number that makes sense uh, for that deal in front of where the company is in its trajectory. Uh, and then the last thing is, is we've, um, 
you know, we have a, a multitude of funds, but um, I'd say relative to some of our peers, our fund size is fairly small. It's part of the reason why we're able to be flexible on the front end. Um, so we're investing out of our fifth early stage fund right now. That's $250 million. Um, and our second growth fund, which is 370. Um, and the check sizes are, are kind of up here. Um, so we've gone super early um, at times. And then um, our, I would say our average uh, for Series A investments is anywhere from kind of three to five million. And I think maybe one thing that most people may not know is that um, although we are based on the coast, um, 73% of the capital that we've invested is actually outside of the coast, um, uh, which is interesting. Um, and then about 13% uh, of the capital we've invested since kind of mid early 2000s has actually been international. One next slide. All right, here are some of our customers. Um, so we invest in a variety of different arenas um, and uh, have kind of continued to uh, build out new areas. Um, I actually focused on cybersecurity um, and also kind of on vertical use cases for machine learning, typically on the early stage fund. Um, but, you know, we kind of segment based on, of, um, you know, background and a number of different other areas. But let's get into the more important... Uh, more interesting, uh, you know, content here. So I think we all over the last several years have uh, been told or have heard or have read that, you know, the VC market is doing really well. Um, my kind of personal interest has always been kind of economics and really the reasons why uh, VC market may be doing well and kind of really what does that mean kind of going forward. And so that's what this section is about. All right. So for the VC market, let's see if this thing will work. Awesome. So everyone can see this? Make sense? Okay. Um, so I thought this was really interesting. It's like generally you're seeing that, so this, this red line being VC, the green line being private equity, the black line being the S&P, where over the last kind of 10 or so years, it's, you know, we've, we've, we've done pretty well um, as a private equity industry, um, outper outperforming the S&P. Uh, but I think more interesting is this kind of this area here around for, uh, 2014, 2015, when venture capital outperformed private equity, which is, I think, just an interesting story. Um, and so part of what we've seen is, is you know, part of what I guess I'm trying to say with this particular slide is, you know, there's been a ton of money pouring into the market, and, and this is kind of part of the reason why um, that is. And we'll, we'll kind of continue to pull back the onion as we go from slide to slide here. Um, so again, kind of digging into and kind of pulling back that first layer is what have, what have IRRs look like over the last, you know, 20 years or so? Um, generally, um, you know, last 10 years, things, things have looked pretty good. I think one thing that's really interesting here is that size of fund seems to play a role, right? So if your fund size is over $250 million in AUM, your lows aren't as low and your highs are higher, Right, um, and so as and you'll kind of see that with the next slide here. Hopefully, Oop, did I slip one? Okay, cool. And so if you'll you'll see that not only oh well, you'll see that in the next in the in a following slide, but basically what I was trying to say is that there's this concept that of that fund size has some type of correlation to higher returns and not as low low returns, if that makes sense. Um, and so we see kind of the same growth and like proliferation of the space to continue, uh, continues as we look at like the, the M&A medians over time. Um, generally, you're seeing that in these gold bars here, um, that the M&A kind of total uh, proceed amounts have started to increase. Generally, IPO markets came back kind of 2017, 2018, which we kind of all understand. Um, I think some of the more interesting area here is the buyout median size. So on pure kind of, you're starting to see like some of these median sizes go up uh, in terms of just pure M&A uh, uh, exit values. And when I look at a chart like that, I'm asking or trying to figure out like why is that and what impact does that have on me as a venture capital fund, right? Um, and so I think this next slide actually does a pretty good job of painting that picture I think I'm just going to use the laptop. All right, cool. Um, basically, what we're showing is what VC cash flows have looked like over the last 
20 years or so. Some of these, these charts are probably a little, I think it's a year old, something like that. Um, but generally what you're seeing is that not only have we started to contribute, so our net cash flow is this green line. It's negative as an industry for a pretty long time, which isn't, um, uh, which is fairly expected when it comes to VC. But generally, as the industry has, um, over, you know, over the last 11 to 12 years here, has trended up, like spiked very well. Um, and as a result, LPs have gotten more excited about kind of the, the space and, and put more money into, um, into, um, into venture capital funds as like an asset class. I think these are all things that we generally understand. I think my issue or kind of what I'm trying to get to is like where specifically that money is going and what is the impact on both VCs and uh, early stage investors. And really kind of what this slide shows is exactly that, right? So on the left here, we have just total fund size, like just pure, um, um, sorry, you have, yeah. So you have total fund size uh, based on, so this is like the percentage of funds that are between zero and 25 million, 25 million and a hundred and what have you. And then you have um, the amount of money that is distributed to those funds based on the fund size. So here from 08 to 2018, you basically see that these smaller funds of zero to 25 are generally the same. So it, it had a huge peak in, in, in 09 have, and has kind of stayed flat around mid to high uh, 20s. Um, and then on the, the fund size for 25 to 100, relatively the same. Everything has been kind of similar. Uh, in terms of the quantity of funds that are between zero and 25, 25 and 100, 100 and 250 million and above. Um, but one thing I think is really interesting is this particular chart here on the right that shows where new money is going. So where are LPs putting their money, right? And you're starting to see that the market has shifted drastically. So back in 08, you're saying these, these smaller kind of 25 to $100 million funds get 6% of new LP dollars. That number is still roughly the same, 6%, and it's kind of bounced around a little bit, but it kind of hovered around maybe 7 to 8% uh, as, a, uh, as a median. Um, and then on, from the 100 to $250 million mark, you've seen a pretty drastic decrease in the amount of new money from LPs that's going to these funds. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question is, the question is, 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 is a clarification of, of, of what I'm trying to explain. And so what, what I'm trying to explain is, is this chart on the left basically shows the number of funds, like the raw number of funds based on their fund size. The chart on the right shows where LPs, institutional investors are putting their money, net new money based on, based on the size of your fund, who is getting less or more money. And so what it shows here is the last couple of slides have basically demonstrated that as a market thing, everyone's doing well. Generally, there's been a great exit environment. IPOs have increased, what have you. Um, what I'm saying here is based on the excitement from LPs to put more money in the space, who is getting that money, right? And what this shows is that the bigger funds in the market get a drastic, a, a, pretty, a pretty drastically higher percentage of net new dollars that come into venture capital funds. And that's not necessarily been different in the past, right? So it's 38% versus 29 versus 27, like fairly flat. Now that 38% has become 66%, right? Wow. And so the next question is, is then if the larger, please. Okay, so the, the next question is, is if the larger funds are getting the money, who's not getting the money is probably the first question, right? So these 250 to $500 million funds, 100, 100 to $250 million funds have gotten pinched a ton, right? So they draw from 29% to 18, 100 to $250 million funds have gotten hurt the most. So 27 to nine. Now, as we kind of go to the next slide is, is based on who's getting the money in this kind of AUM arms race, what does that mean for early stage founders? What does that mean for those that are trying to raise seed Series A rounds? 
All right. So this first reflection is that, you know, raising seed capital has become increasingly, increasingly difficult, right? So uh, basically what we're showing here is the, the bars or the capital invested just generally within uh, the venture market. Um, and you're seeing, you know, an increase in the amount of capital that's been invested. And generally what you want to see with an increase is you would think that for each stage of deal, angel, seed, early, later stage, you have that same increase, right? And so generally you're seeing like that same increase. Um, you're starting to see like these later stage rounds has been, has, there was kind of a slight increase here, but generally what we would call that flat over the last 10 years, early stage, there's been a pretty dramatic increase up till about 2015. I think here early stage is, um, it would be kind of series A, series B. Um, and then generally kind of like a little bit of a bottom, I wouldn't say bottoming out, but a, a flat line from 2014 to 2017. And you're starting to see a little bit of a tick down. Um, at the earliest stages, this green line is pretty dramatic, right? So the number of seed deals, so new money into seed companies has drastically changed. It's pretty much fallen off of a cliff from between 2014 to 2015, right? So first reflection, and we'll get into kind of what that means. Second reflection is that funding uh, more mature companies has pushed Series A founders to do more with less, right? So generally, kind of what the last slide showed is not much money is there for seed stage companies or drastically less relative to what's happened in the past. And these later stage companies are getting a little bit more, better, a bigger proportion of that same uh, dollar amount. Uh, that's coming in. So what does that mean for, you know, your series A, series C, uh, you know, startups? And I think these two charts do a pretty good job of, um, of paying that picture. Um, the one on the left here basically shows that kind of what are the median amount of years between rounds, right? So after you raise your seed, how many years does it take for you to raise an A? And those, those numbers have pushed up for every, for every series. So this top line here is series B, Back in 2017, it was roughly 4.9. Now it's five years. So that's between, after raising an A, it took them another five years to raise the, the sorry, from the, start of the, this, from the start of the founding of the company, it took them five years to raise a, uh, a Series B, which is pretty, uh, is a much longer time than back in this kind of 2010 area when it was like roughly maybe four years. Um, I think the most drastic increase here, again, um, is like the more earlier stage, right? So both for seed here, you're sitting at a roughly uh, maybe one and a half years or so. Now you're up at roughly three, so 2.85 years. And then for series A, you're, you're sitting, you were sitting at roughly, you know, two, 2.2 years. Now you're up at like 3. Point, um, is that 3.5 or so. So it's taking much longer to raise the same rounds that were, um, um, then they would taken much longer to raise the same round that you could have raised in previous years. And then I think here on the right, I can't see it as well as plants in the way, but um, and basically what this says is that fewer U.S. startups are reaching Series A rounds just in general, right? And for those that are reaching Series A rounds, the bar has been has has grown or kind of been lifted um, pretty like precipitously. So for those that are actually raising, roughly seventy percent of those are already revenue. They already have revenue versus you know ten years ago that number was two percent. That number is now seventy. Now, um, third reflection is now given that you know there's more um, given the pinch that has happened in funds. Uh, where there's less money going into um, earlier stage funds that are more likely to fund earlier stage founders. Those earlier stage founders are feeling a ton more pressure, um, a lot more pressure to not only build uh, you know, great businesses and launch amazing products, but also prove revenue. Um, you know, one thing that's kind of on the, pro the positive side of it is if you're able to do that, the valuations have, have definitely ticked up demonstrating that you that there is a reward for those types of uh, uh, for that type of hard work and kind of getting through the through the slog of of building a C to you know series A company right and so you've seen it pretty um, kind of across the board here whether it be from seed uh, back in 2010 the you know the the pre money at the time was roughly three million that's now seven million for a seed uh, stage company Series A, 6 to 20. That's even a, kind of a, a little bit of a larger um, tick up. And then 
for Series B, which is which tend, I, I would say in today's market is probably one of the most competitive on the VC end. Um, it's probably one of the most competitive rounds to get into for some of the kind of more experienced, kind of hottest companies in the space. The the um, the valuation. Uh, the pre-money valuation has ticked up like extremely high relative to the the growth of these other rounds. And one thing, and we talked about this a little bit on the panel on Wednesday, is this um, the growing. Uh, I guess how, how do I explain this? The, the kind of the growing use of words like seed one or seed two, seed three, or seed extension or what have you, um, and it makes sense given that you know some of the other charts that we showed. Um, and kind of went through is you know, it's taking a lot more time to raise the seed round, raise your Series A round, raise your Series B round. And so the thought is, is if you're, um, you know, if you need, you know, that that extra kind of pre full round raise, uh, or maybe you're raising an extra hundred thousand dollars or three hundred thousand dollars or what have you um, to get you to your next milestone, so you could then raise like a much larger, you know, multi million dollar Series A or Series B or what have you. Um, uh, you know, folks are doing it and, and VCs are leaning in and making that happen. I think this is just the last reflection here is that every extension eats away equity value, right? So if you're, if you're a founder and the thought is, is I'll, you know, I'm on C2 and I think I'll take another 300,000 for C3 and what have you, you should remember that equity value is diminished drastically for each one of the rounds that, uh, that you raise. Okay. So, so what can we do about it, right? Um, a lot of uh, you know, kind of doomsday <laughs> charts up here, but um, th- I think there's still you know a ton um, that's attractive uh, to starting early stage companies, um, and kind of how can an early stage founder navigate the market that uh, you know that's out there today? Um, I think one, the first advice I give is is find the best investors for your business, right? And what does that mean? That doesn't necessarily that, that that means one. Not only do they do they invest in this space, do they have portfolio portfolio companies that could be potential partners? Do has the particular investor that would sit on your board, you know, have operating experience in the space that you've been in, uh, what have you? Um, often, what happens in, in uh, you know kind of along these lines is you you know you're out you're out raising and and you're trying to convince people that don't necessarily believe in the business model or aren't on the same page with where your business is going um and so you know the, the thought is is to you know center your search around people that believe right there is there there is the balance between trying to convince someone that uh, is close and and pitching someone that you know is is not going to lean in um Secondly, is to is to execute efficiently and, and clearly understand what the business levers are. Right. So, um, examples of this are what unit economics look like. If it's a B two B business, you know, I want to understand for every dollar that I invest in the business, how many dollars are coming out of it. Like, what value is 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 being built um, uh, built off of that initial investment. Um, understanding what sales efficiency looks like. Understanding what the velocity drivers are of the business. In many cases, whether it be seed or Series A, there are you know some. You may not have you know all of these types of kind of metrics and and uh, early learnings locked in as of yet. But I think understanding and having an opinion on you know what can drive that business. At you know what did I learn with my with my pre seed launch? If I'm in beta, what am I learning? If if I went and I raised a seed round of you know five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars or what have you, where did that money get invested? How do we invest it? What do we learn along the way? Did it get us closer to product market fit, right? Um, and then lastly here is, is stay tuned to, to how the market thinks about you, your industry, and your business. There's a ton. I listed a lot of, uh, a lot of B2B uh, kind of uh, resources uh, out here, but whether it be you know, a lot of funds are, are putting a, a ton of, of interesting data out there on their, on their investments. So there'd be Bessemer SaaS index. OpenView has their SaaS metrics where they kind of do a whole kind of market research, uh, perform market research on the space and say, hey, look, for a seed investment, this is what we're, this is what we're seeing the revenue at. This is where we're seeing kind of customers. This is what traction may look like, what have you. Really try to understand kind of where do you fit within that landscape and inject that into your fundraising story, right? Um, and the last thing is, at, at the end of the day, is, is customers are the, are, are the people that can tell you the most. Right, so continue to kind of talk to customers. Um, getting to what, why you may get a pass, 
Um, and I think we may have two slides left here, but get into why you may, may get a pass from a fund. So the first kind of area here is this uh, common reasons for passing without a meeting. So you didn't have a meeting uh, with the fund. You know, why are, you know, what are the, the kind of the, the main issues that we kind of find um, to be the main drivers of, of why we pass? Um, I think history is, I'll start there, is, is typically um, a big one. And, and a, a, I wouldn't say the most kind of, um, uh, I wouldn't say the easiest pass, but just understanding that the story, again, the story of the company really matters. If you've raised you know, $15 million and you have a million dollars in, in revenue, the efficiency story there just, just doesn't, you know, it doesn't look great. And so um, you, you know, most folks may look at your deck and see that and say, this isn't, you know, it's not for us. Um, maybe market uh, as well. So maybe it's outside. I'm on the BDB end, uh, typically in, in, in cyber and in ML. And, you know, I do a little bit of marketplaces, but if say it's a, you know, you're, you're making a new, like a blowing glass company or something like that, it just doesn't fit within the sector focus. It's not going to be worth your time or my time for us to have a conversation about ways that I, that I'm just, I can't help you. Right. Um, moving on to the next area here is common reasons for passing after one meeting. Um, I think probably the top one here, uh, the team uh, is, is super, super important. Um, when the CEO is not a CEO is, is, is an interesting statement. And basically what that means is, you know, we'll have a meeting with a founder and the CEO is, you know, not doing the pitch, not answering questions. It's a president, it's a head of biz dev, that is answering questions and it's not the person that's like leading the company, right? Um, that just, it's a, just a certain amount of, um, you know, it, it, it makes us think, you know, either there's an interesting team dynamic that doesn't necessarily make sense or, you know, we're in this case, we're back in the CEO and, and hopefully, you know, the CEO is, is kind of leading the company going forward. Um, deal terms is, a, is an easy one. Uh, in some cases, you know, we've had folks come in and, you know, they'll, they'll ask for, Deal terms that may not be, uh, you know, along the same lines is kind of where the market is, and that's why again it's important to understand like what market dynamics look like, uh, and you know all the all the slides that I pulled, all that data is public. Um, just understanding kind of where the market is and what you know, making sure that as you're going through negotiations and you know you're you're along the same lines and kind of in line with with what uh, what market economics look like. Uh, jumping to the last one here, uh, common reasons for passing in diligence. Um, yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's on the financial side, I mean, typically on, on my end, on the BDB, and that's typically where it's uh, kind of the highest reason, uh, the most kind of uh, common reason. Um, and really, you know, you're digging into, um, you know, the financials and understanding cohorts and just realizing that, you know, while you may have, you know, for every thousand leads that come in, you know, the first 20% of those or whatever it may be, you're losing within the first six or seven months, right? And so, understanding kind of, you know, not only, you know, getting into, you know, why people will download or use your product or you know, what that daily usage looks like, but do they stay, why they stay, how can you keep them staying, how sticky um, is the product is um, super important. Uh, and then now just kind of getting to just overall kind of pitch issues. Um, I think all, all of these are equally important. It, you know, it comes up a lot. Um, you know, I think one of the more interesting ones here is um, is just being dismissive of, of competition. For every for every idea, there's there's tons and tons of, of, of folks out there that that are are chasing it, that are building something. Um, and uh, you know, you should probably assume, especially for thesis driven funds, that um, if they're meeting with you, they've probably met with other companies that are doing something similar or tangential to your space. Right. Um, and so the thought that no one else is doing this, I'm the only one, it, it, you know, I think it's just a tough statement. Um, and kind of just running through these one irrelevant market sizing will say like, hey, you know, this a uh, hundred billion dollar market um, globally. And then once you get to like what the local kind of service addressable market is, it's like 500 million, which is fine. I think, I think just understanding uh, that's like another thing that we kind of take away from the meeting is right. It's just understanding kind of. Where, where do I sit within the landscape 
of this type of market? Where do I go to now? What's my next phase for kind of increasing like the market size or what my adjustable market size is, is an important story to tell. Um, I think uh, the, the second to last one here in terms of just thinking and speaking and, uh, and milestones first uh, versus, um, <laughs> versus actually making money um, and trying to drive top line uh, is it, I think it's an interesting time and just kind of interesting topic in general within VC um, on the BDB end. Yeah, you know, I, at the end of the day, I, you know, I, I, it's not that we will absolutely have to f- have find uh, companies and will only back founders that are driving revenue. Um, I think it goes back to like one of the earlier slides is that 70% of Series A companies are making money. They may not be profitable, uh, which is completely different and understand that, but uh, they're making money. I think thinking and kind of speaking to what the milestones of the business look like over time within the context of, you know, this is how we're going to, on the B2B end, you know, grow ARR or we're going to, you know, land and expand within this client and this is why the demographic is X, Y, and Z. Um, and how does that drive top line um, and learnings for kind of future growth of the business is, is just a super important um, part of things. Um, I think that's my last slide, actually. Yeah, that's it. So happy to answer questions. Hopefully that was helpful. Thank you, Brent. That was amazing. So much data there for us to look at, and, and the, the results that you pulled from that are, are really fantastic. So we're going to open this up to q and um, I pass the microphone to John. This is a great time to ask questions about fundraising, ask questions about the VC market. Not such a great time to pitch your company on why Brent should invest. Uh, so John, here you go. Okay. Start back here since I saw your hand first. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you. Um, your last three slides were, um, were so good. It is very true. I see those issues every day. Yeah. My question is about reporting. Um, if you can go back to your slide about uh, comparison of different returns on, on PE, uh, Venture, and REIT, and also about the AUM. So my question is, um, um, since... This one? Uh, 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 previous, uh, two more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, one more. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So my question is about reporting because um, REIT is a public trade um, um, vehicle, and you get all the uh, you know almost um, 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 true data. Um, venture capital, private equity. I think venture capital. Um, um, I don't know the, the reporting requirements. Say a family office, if they invest in a company, do you get the data? So um, how reliable this is when you do a comparison? Will there be survival bias, etc., so that you are not really comparing the true landscape? We've listed um, um, investment, and the second thing, uh, second question, same same area is um, about the AUM. Because of that, um, does it affect by them? Since right now, more institutional money are going into venture, right? That, does it make the, the the bigger money report more um, uh, um, becoming more uh, um, obvious? So it skew the the uh, percentage. Got it. So I'm going to try to answer both of those. Um, so on the first one, just on. I don't think this works. Oh, does it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so on the first question about reporting, every for institutionally backed GP for institutionally backed VC funds, there is so for we we send reports to our um, to our LPs quarterly reports when we're raising money. They they see the full portfolio. Um, this here is about like actual exits. I do, well, it's about IRRs as related to exits. I do think that, um, and it's just tracked for what Cambridge, Cambridge is a research organization, a very large kind of LP. They're kind of the, um, at the forefront of, I would say, returns and IR data for, uh, for the venture capital um, asset class, right? So a lot of us will send our returns to Cambridge. They don't share them, but they do put out reports that kind of speak to what's happening in the space. Um, so First question, hopefully, hopefully that was answered, but that we, that we do report. I do think that there are, which is like a whole nother conversation, there are different ways. Like anytime you look at IRR, IRR is going to be impacted by time, right? So if I, you know, gotten in a company, I may have had a $10 million like net inflow of money uh, from that investment. Say I invested $7 million, I got $10 million back. It's not great cash on cash, but that IRR after like a year is probably pretty attractive, 
right? So that's, that's definitely, I think that's what you're bringing up is super relevant. So that's one way uh, that this could be somewhat different. I do think it's directional. Um, the second way is based off of, I mean, there's, there's a huge amount of talk just around, especially in the VC side, around what markups, uh, how markups affect um, your return profile as a fund. Meaning if I invested in a company a year ago at a $20 million valuation and I have to give a report to my, um, to my um, two years go by or a year goes by and I have to give a report to my LP about kind of where that company sits, but they haven't raised another round, right? So theoretically, I would assume that the valuation of that company has increased because I invested over a year ago, but do I report 20 the $20 million post, or do I report something else? Maybe do I look at a, a comp and say like, hey, this is a direct competitor. They raised a round, but what if there weren't any rounds raised by a direct competitor? What if there's not any m and I do think that's where you'll see like the waviness in these types of numbers. What was the second question? Sorry. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, it sounds like I'm. Correct me if I'm wrong. So it sounds like you're saying this slide shows the percentage of dollars of net dollars put. Sorry, of new dollars put into VC from LPs and who is going to this this chart on the right. And you're saying that that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a decrease in the amount of money going to the early stage companies. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. In, in number terms. In in, 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 number yeah, in absolute numbers. Yeah, I'm so, so here, maybe I can kind of, yeah, I think this is what this shows. So my statement is around not necessarily absolute dollars because like you could, I do think that if you look at the, the raw data, there is a decrease in the absolute dollars. But what this is showing is that there's a decrease in the absolute number, raw number of investments. So I agree, I agree with you that there, I'm not saying that just to be clear that there's, a, that this chart shows that there's a less amount of absolute dollars going because it could be larger rounds to a smaller amount of companies, right? I do think that when you put these, these two charts next to each other and along and you kind of group in the number of um, how long companies have been staying private and the number of like additional rounds and new money going into companies, the overall size, I do think that directionally so, and I think, you know, kind of the data is suggested that larger funds are getting larger and they make more money by being even larger, right? And so at some point, it doesn't make sense for me. If I feel like my dollar, my, the, the net return on, the, on a dollar that I invest is going to make more sense putting it already back into my winner that's staying private at a series E, a series F, a series G versus risking that dollar on the new, on a new company, I'm going to back the winner. I'm going to continue to back the winner. Yeah, of course. Great questions. Um, <clears throat> good morning. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, going back to your previous slide, reflection one, raising seed capital. Um, yeah, that one. The green line you pointed out is going down the angel seed investing. Uh, seems like that could be uh, the. There could be two reasons. One, you're not seeing uh, the the market's not seeing interesting deals that they want to put seed money into or they're just pulling out of uh, angel seed investing. Uh, what, can you dig into the reasons for that a little bit more? Thanks. Yeah, no, great question. Um, so I'll talk to the latter first in terms of just pulling out. I don't think so. I, again, I think a lot of these slides are, um, they're, 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 very, they're very much so related. I wouldn't say that there's been a massive pullback out of seed. I think there's actually a number of, depending on where you sit, whether you're on the $500 million in AUM above uh, um, size of fund, 
um, or you're at 25 and below. I think 25 and below, you're going to continue doing seed. I think you are starting to see for some of these 250 to 500 or even maybe 500 to 750 million do a lot more seed. Right, because you're starting to see like these these greater, whether it be strategics that are entering the space, or hedge funds that are entering the space, or PE firms that have started. You know, I mean, Oak Tree has a healthcare <laughs> growth fund. Um, KKR Growth has one. There's there's a few. There's there's a ton of others out there that were they're they're starting to compress and and drive up valuations for those later stages. When I talked about Series B stage earlier and how the valuation has continued, it's like one of the most competitive areas within venture right now. I think part of the reason why that is because some of these latter stages, I would say like our our older brothers and sisters within the private equity industry have definitely leaned in. And in many cases, I think for those those middle tier funds, um, here I'll try to find the slide. The, the red and the orange, it makes, they, they get more, it kind of goes back to this question, you get more dollar value if you then start a seed, uh, a, a seed practice, right? And I think that's part of what you're seeing. We, we've certainly been much more active in it. Does that make sense? So I'm sorry, uh, can smaller, we just leave it to one fund, question, please? The, or the bigger the fund, the less likely <laughs> they're going to do seed. Right? I think, the, I think it's, it's hard to, I, was, I would add one more factor. It's like the bigger the fund and the more successful your later stage investments have been, I think you are drawn to putting more money in what you already know is winning versus going downstream. These mid-sized funds that may not have as many large winners already, I think, and they're, all, and they're feeling a bunch of pressure from bigger uh, fund sizes, bigger, larger uh, firms, it makes more sense to go earlier. Which puts more, frankly, we can even talk about it more offline, but puts probably more pressure on the smaller firms and angel investors and angel syndicates as well. Oh, that's All interesting. Right. Uh, um, not, not about the VC stuff, but really about the tech. What do you think is interesting that's happening in AI and ML right now? Yeah. Where do you see that technology? What, what do you find exciting? Yeah. No. Yeah. Great question. Um, so um, a number, a number of different areas. So I, I've say on the cyber side, um, the I've spent a lot of time in like data compliance, data privacy, um, more of that space, autonomous threat detection. Those areas I think are interesting. On outside of th- cyber, just vertical use cases, ML. We invested in a company called Botkeeper. They use machine learning to automate bookkeeping. Um, so I think we're going to spend more time looking for vertical use cases for ML that would automate out kind of, I wouldn't say automate out, but automate the CFO tech stack, right? So whether that be kind of um, uh, like treasury, for example. So if I can, if SMBs can send me kind of their, what their, their AP looks like or what their AR looks like and just overall billings. I've better understand, better, better manage their cash inflow outflow for like an SMB, kind of basically give them, give an SMB the same, you know, treasury department that a Nike or any other big, large company would have. I think that's a, a really interesting um, area as well uh, within the space. Um, I think outside of that, we made investments in, you know, autonomous, we have an autonomous vehicle company uh, called Optimus Ride. They're based out in, in Boston. Um, another, I think, really interesting area. Um, I think my overall kind of excitement uh, when it comes to ML um, is when it's not necessarily replacing, but uh, improving um, where kind of the, the, the human workflow, right? So I think a lot of that was like I've seen on the financial services side, and I think we're starting to see it in a number of other areas as well. Over here, Brian. Brian. Yeah. Uh, really basic question here, but I can't remember if it's the slide before or after that one or two um, Let's see. Go back. It's one of the first. Yeah, well, hold on. The one without the growth. Yes. This one. Yeah. The, my actually only question is, I just can't tell the color that's at the bottom. Is it the uh, hedge fund? Uh, which one? What's Here? the blue Here? at the bottom? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's hedge funds. When? Why do you? Why is that so much lower? And that's kind of fascinating with hedge funds. Ha- so I didn't talk. I didn't talk about that. Uh, I think it's a really good point. You, you pulled that out. Um, there's a huge debate whether active or passive investment uh, advisors uh, or ma- investment managers within the hedge fund space, um, uh, you know, which is better. I think they're, they're in a tough spot 
Yeah. <laughs> and it's not, not even to, to kind of be silly about it, but just, just honestly, I, you know, I think that the, I don't, I don't know what the breakage is between like active and passive managers here, or, but I think there's, there's, there's a ton of debate and this is, this is the reason why there, there's been that debate over the last, really, I feel like it's only been over like the last three to five years. But I mean, if you look at returns over the last, you know, 10 plus years, they probably should have been having the debate maybe right around here. Um, hey, Brett, question about um, geography. You guys are certainly one of the top firms here in Southern California. What portion of your work um, are in deals that are in Southern California? Uh, you mentioned a Boston deal. I know you have a big office in New York. Yep. Can you talk about kind of commitment to Southern California, quality of deal flow, oh, yeah. and um, what your assessment is of, of the market here locally? Yeah. No, yeah. So uh, just in terms of, I don't have like an exact proportion of like what our um, what the number of investments that we've made here, like in LA and Southern California specifically. Um, there's a number that we're chasing right now. I know like on our consumer end, a ton of the investments that they've made in the last six months have been based here. Most of those seed um, in terms of like the talent and uh, and just overall kind of increase in, in te- the tech ecosystem here. I think it's been drastic, right? Like I've, I've like maybe with, with us and I've, I've, been in San Francisco, I've been in Chicago, I've been in the New York and I've seen those those ecosystems and you know they've proliferated over time. I do think that being in Southern California, whether it be here in Pasadena or down in San Diego or up in you know Santa Barbara, slow uh, area, I think there's a ton of different companies that are being built. I think on the enterprise side, I'm really excited, especially with cyber. I mean, there's a ton of talent down here. A ton of talent. I think there's a lot, um, whether it be you know Symantec or Broadcom or here in this area. I mean, there's there's just a number of different um, companies that are being built here. And I think also, so I think it's just one that I think the folks have kind of woken woken up to the fact that there are big tech companies in Southern California. That's kind of a. I think B that there are a number of talented universities here, right? Um, and so whether it be you know the five C's or here, Caltech, um, or SC, or UCLA, or you know, really wherever, um, that, are, that are coming out of that. And I think lastly, um, when I tried to make the move back uh, and was kind of uh, trying to figure out kind of what, where I wanted to go, knew I wanted to come home uh, to LA, but I also knew I wanted to be an enterprise. Right? I, I didn't I didn't sound that I don't like consumer. I've worked for a consumer company in the past. Uh, so there's nothing there for that. But I just felt like there was a greater opportunity on the enterprise side with overall within venture. Um, and so one of the, the few things or the, probably the very first thing that I wanted to do when I when I landed back was like kind of debunk this whole thought process that Southern California is about B2C and direct to consumer and media. And, and it is, I mean, there are areas where that, that is certainly the case. Um, but I definitely feel like whether it be, um, you know, silence or CrowdStrike or Symantec or, um, upkeep or audible. I mean, these are all, you know, going to be already winners or going to be huge, huge companies. Um, and so I would say whether it's enterprise um, or consumer, I think LA is certainly a place to come and build your company. And I think it's being reflected in the dollars that are coming in, right? We're, we're no longer necessarily competing against LA-based investors, right? Like I have you know, friends that are coming in from Boston saying, hey, I'm here for two days. Can I crash at your place? I'm here to see X, Y, and Z company, right? And you've, you're seeing more. I mean, Pelion from Utah just opened up an office here. There's, there's a ton um, of opportunities there. Over here, Brian. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so a couple of really related questions, but basically off of the, the main topic I think that's coming out today is kind of big funds are getting bigger and how that affects kind of the VC landscape. But I'm curious to see if you see like a trend with, you know, these massive funds like the Vision Fund, which is $100 billion mm-hmm. um, and their investments and how that's kind of changing the landscape because... Um, for instance, like their investment in WAG, mm-hmm. which wasn't a clear winner, but if you give them three hundred million dollars, yeah. well, you basically picked one, yeah. right? And so, how does that? And maybe their WeWork investment is maybe the opposite, you know, argument to that point. But do you see that as a trend um, rather than um, kind of like an offset? And then a related question is: these big venture division fund and these bigger funds that are coming on board are primarily funded through sovereign wealth funds, and sometimes like 
comes with strings attached. Like we're seeing this now with investments in Hollywood. We're seeing this with that, what's happening in the NBA. How does that affect the VC landscape? That's a good question. Um, so I guess my thoughts are kind of perspective on the vision fund um, is that it's, it's, it's a new model. I would, I would call it like a new VC model Starting. in terms of if, if you can, it's kind of similar to, um, well, we can talk offline, but anyway, the, the th- my thought is, is if you have $100 billion and you can king make, right, and say like, hey, 50 or, you know, 10 billion to this person or 3 billion or whatever it is, 500 million to this particular company uh, and, and try to kind of flood that cap table and enable them to do more. Um, I think it's an interesting model to have. It'll be interesting to see kind of what we work looks like for them and kind of how that impacts their portfolio going forward. Uh, I think there's, there's arguments to be made in both directions about, you know, whether that's just written off like any other, you know, VC investment that doesn't necessarily work out or maybe they rebound or whatever. I think that's that end. I think in terms of kind of your second question of how that impacts VC and maybe what's happened, I think you're starting to see it and have, have seen it in the past. Some of the larger, I mean, Sequoia raised, I think, six or seven billion. Um, there's been another of other company, G- GFC just closed another two billion, uh, you know, a single fund, right? I mean, it, it is certainly uh, changing the way that uh, um, that competitive landscape looks like because you do want to be able to defend your pro rata, right? Like if it gets to a point where, um, and, and that, I feel like that's part of part of the the discussion with LPs in terms of raising these these very large funds is, hey, I've backed you know a company that's doing extraordinarily well. They're a leader in the space. If I can't make if I can't make my pro rata for the next round, that you know it, I'm I'm going to cut my you know cut myself back. So I might as well raise another round, right? Um, and so um, I, I do think that it's shifting. It's everything seems to be shifting up. And it'll be really interesting to see just how, how that impacts what VC will look like going forward. I think what I presented here is just kind of the, the, the initial kind of, um, this is like lagging indicators, right? So we've already, so all this stuff has already happened. Um, I do think that um, the pull that kind of, I wouldn't say middle market, but like these, if you're in the 250 to 500 range, I think you're, that's a lot of pressure that you're getting. If I just raise, if I'm a, you know, a billion plus dollar fund, you know, my, what used to be a $5 million seed when I was a $250 million fund could be a $10 million seed. And I still, you know, I still kind of, I wouldn't say write it off, but I, I, that, it could be a much larger seed because I have the money to make that sort of investment. And my, my, my risk factor doesn't necessarily change as much. And I see, I think I, you're seeing that even more with like kind of, I think the series B stage and kind of what's happening there right now is probably series, probably say series B series C, like it's kind of like early growth rounds and how one, how competitive they are Two, um, there could be like how fast the rounds move. Um, cause if, if your round is moving very quickly, that's, that's less time to do diligence. That's less time for, for most other things as well. And so you have to be, get conviction very quickly, yeah, I think there's a lot of fallout that could come to that. There could also be a lot of good as well. Yeah, this is a really short one and really simple. So um, when you're looking at a deal at Graycroft, do you ever see a deal with high churn that you decide you can improve because you have the contacts or you can see where the faults lie? That's a good question. Um, a deal with high churn. Um, on the B2B end... I don't see that as much uh, where we feel like we can improve it because it's, it's, I don't want to call it binary, but I do think it's more of a binary uh, customer decision to like adopt the software or not relative to consumer, right? Consumer, it could be like the new hot thing and then it, you know, is less hot, <laughs> right? Or it's the new hot thing and it skyrockets. I feel like on the BDB end, it is, hey, like we're adopting this, we're pulling this in. Um, and, and it, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily leave as much, but I do think that there are times when you're a company may be earlier in their trajectory on, on either end. Um, and they've built, you know, they've gone to market with a certain product, the product that wasn't necessarily like an extendable platform to begin. They, you know, they lost you a few customers and I think are even more powerful story than winning new customers is those that you lose and they come back. Right. So I do think that there are, I would say that there are some cases where we've seen that happen. Yeah. 
Brent, thanks for your uh, for your talk. A lot of really good information. I'd like to bring this back down to earth because a lot of people that are here are either startups or early stage companies, and they are seeking seed rounds or, or uh, seed capital. The um, <clears throat> it seems to me that the access to capital is not very efficient for this market. Uh, we've had uh, other VCs talk about wanting to write that three to five million dollar check. Graycroft might be also in that area. But when it comes to the smaller rounds, if you're talking about $300,000, now you're looking at 10 deals as opposed to just one deal. So what, would you, what can you say about this market that can improve on its efficiency or help the entrepreneurs with raising their, their seed round? Because it seems like the larger investors, even the VCs like Graycroft, are, are looking for those bigger deals. Yeah, so I guess there's, I would say, one, one slight... Um one slight kind of pushback. I would say like, look on, on, on our end, we definitely do. We have a pretty large seed practice. So we, we do seed, um, very much so. Um, and I do think that in the, the LA environment, there are a ton, there are a ton of, of pre-seed seed, uh, stage investors, um, that focus on that area. Many is one of them at 10, one ten. here. There's, there's, you know, obviously 10, one ten. there's, there's, Graycroft, there's Pelion that just moved here. Um, there's a number of, I would say, like even in, in LA that are based here. Um, that's probably we have, you know, pre seed, seed, found, um, VCs, focused VCs in, in spades, right? So, like, my presentation, I don't want to, you know, I want to make sure to be, this is clear that this is general overall, you know, VC market, US based VC market. This is global, but generally it's U.S. based. Um, but so I don't want to, you know, toss out like a like a doom, doomsday situation. Um, but I do think at the end of the day that uh, there's a few things that you know that we look for and that could be that could be interesting. Is one, you know, kind of talked about this on Wednesday is you know developing the like getting in front of you know to get as much feedback as you can, right? Whether that be from VCs, whether that be from experienced entrepreneurs, whether that be from kind of friends, family, users what have you. And I think when it comes to experienced entrepreneurs or VCs or it, it, getting in front of them before you're raising, I think is super important and building those types of relationships. This is like a repeat uh, model, right? Where, where folks will, it will you'll meet at an event like this, maybe connect for a coffee. You may not raise for like another two years, um, but, or another year or six months or whatever it may be. But that, that relationship that you're starting to build when you don't necessarily need anything, is super important. I think to understanding kind of, um, you know, you, what your go to market is as a early stage company. Um, and what the, um, um, how you well, one, how you plan to sell, how do you plan to retain the learnings that you've had from it, maybe an MVP or, or a beta product before are extremely important and just helping VCs that aren't in your business that, but that may understand the space. Um, help them better kind of level set where you are in your trajectory and kind of whether they're the right person or whether the, you know, a seed round of 3 million or a hundred thousand or 500,000 or what have you is, is, is helpful. Right. Um, and I think, uh, lastly, again, is I'm not, I'm a huge proponent of it. It's just like really understanding what your story is. And it's not just the story of your product, that's one story. And the other story is like kind of what you're telling people on the deck. But I think additionally, it's kind of where do you fit in today's, like we talked about seed extensions and seed one, seed two, and all of these different kind of things. Where do you fit within that, right? Because someone may come to, I may have a meeting with a founder and they'll say, hey, we, we raise a million and a half and we're labeling that pre-seed. We're now raising a seed and we're going to do a $5 million seed. And then the very next founder will come in and say, hey, we're doing a $200,000 seed, right? I think just really understanding kind of how does, how does the numbers that you put out there, because as soon as you tell me, hey, I'm, I'm looking for X, I'm saying, okay, well, I just saw, I'm, I'm starting to understand and, and level set myself on where you fit in, in the market for other companies that may look like this. Is it B2B marketplace for, you know, um, construction workers, and I saw, I saw three of those before. I saw a similar B2B marketplace for something else. They are all raising anywhere from like one and a half to $3 million. This is, this is what the metrics look like. Like I'm going back through the decks just to understand and level set. 
generally kind of where you are then so I can go deep and say, okay, cool. Based on, you know, tell me a little bit more about the drivers. Like how is your demand side of the marketplace doing? How is supply? Like how are you connecting those two? Is it bettering the incentives of both areas? Like really understanding kind of how to pitch and how to tell that story, whether it be from a team perspective, fundraising or traction, I think is super important. Brand, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. (laughs) 